Iraqi army fled Kuwait in March 1991, it left behind 610 burning oil wells. In May 1991, the University of Washington's Cloud and Aerosol Research Group took its research aircraft to the Persian Gulf to study the smokes from the fires and their effects on the atmosphere. Six AM in Bahrain. Although we are two hundred and fifty miles from Kuwait, the smoke from the fires produces a brilliant red sunrise. The University of Washington's research team was chosen for this project because of their experience in studying gases, particles and clouds in the atmosphere and the emissions from volcanoes, forest fires and industries. Their research aircraft, a Convair C-131, is one of the best instrumented facilities in the world for such studies. For Ken McMillan, ex-Navy pilot, this is an opportunity to exercise his flying skills in a difficult and unique environment. Dr. Ray Weiss, an expert on the optical properties of smoke, looks forward to obtaining measurements on extraordinary thick smoke. Aircraft mechanic Joe Stagner wonders what damage the smoke will cause to the aircraft. All this is smoke. The smoke was never observed to rise above 19,000 feet and was generally below 9,000 feet. Flight meteorologist Art Rangno discusses measuring strategies as the aircraft approaches Kuwait. The top of the smoke was generally confined by a temperature inversion. Sometimes, as seen here, the top of the smoke looked like breaking waves. Team leader Professor Peter Hobbs studies video displays of measurements being made from the aircraft. Meteorologist Dave Nance monitors measurements of the sizes and concentrations of particles in the air. As preparations are made for entering the smoke, crew members put on their gas masks. Graduate student Krista Larson prepares filters through which samples of the smoke will be passed. Later, these filters will be analyzed to determine the amounts of soot and other materials in the smoke. Dr. Ray Weiss prepares to record the optical properties of the smoke. Smoke from oil fires north of Kuwait City are seen in the distance. Contained within this tube is a laser which can be used rather like a radar for mapping the extent of the smoke. Still flying above the smoke, the aircraft starts to descend into the smoke from the fires south of Kuwait City. With all instruments ready to go, the crew prepares for four hours of flying through thick smoke. To obtain a view of the fires, the aircraft is first flown upwind of the large Bergen oil field. Over 280 oil wells were alight in this field alone, and over the whole of Kuwait there were more than 530 fires. The smoke from different wells had different colors, ranging from quite white to very black. From analysis of smoke samples taken aboard the aircraft, it was later discovered that the white smoke was due to salt pumped up with the oil. The individual smoke plumes seen here merge together at a short distance downwind to form a single very large plume of smoke. This plume was still visible 800 miles from Kuwait. Translated to the United States, if the fires had been in New York, the smoke plume would have extended to Florida, where it would have been over 100 miles wide. Oil from the Kuwait fields is under natural pressure. Therefore, if the fires were not put out, they could have raged indefinitely. Firefighters on the ground extinguished over two fires a day. The blackest smoke came from burning of pools of oil on the ground. From the thickest portions of the smoke, oil rained out like rain over large regions of the desert. This, together with oil from gushing wells that were not on fire, produced a tar-like material over the desert. 
Like ash felt, this material absorbed most of the sun's radiation. This could affect the heat balance of the region even after the fires are extinguished. In some cases, firefighters would extinguish a fire only to have to relight it if they failed to cap the oil well. Otherwise, large quantities of oil would have showered over the desert. Here we see very black smoke coming from a large pool of oil on the ground. With air temperatures in the hundreds, plus heat from the fires, temperatures in the cabin of the University of Washington's aircraft often rose to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. In reflecting on his experience in this project, Professor Hobbs was to say later, it was fire, heat and smoke, a vision of Dante's Inferno. It was as close to hell as I ever want to get. After six hours of exhausting work, the aircraft heads back to Bahrain. The aircraft is covered in oil. This is the windscreen. It will need thorough cleaning before it can be flown again. This is the nose of the plane. The crew will now analyze its measurements overnight and prepare for another flight tomorrow into the inferno. These studies by the University of Washington were supported by several government agencies and the National Geographic Society. Dr. Richard Greenfield of the National Science Foundation played a key role in coordinating funding.